Hi, everybody. I'm Tina Brock, Producing Artistic Director here at the Idiopathic Radiculopathy Consortium, and you have joined us for a virtually existential dinner conversation. And every Saturday at 5 p.m., we will show up here at the IRC dinner table, and we will talk to our favorite artists and friends about the work they're doing, the work they have done, the existential challenges we are all facing and the many great things that we have to look forward to and how we can work together to uh, get to know each other a little better and just see what we can put out into the world during this time and when we come back again. So a little housekeeping uh, while we wait and get everybody in the room. Our front of house is working very hard to get you in the room today. And speaking of the room, I am in front of Bimbo's 365, which is a club in, uh, out in uh, San Francisco. And that is, uh, that's where I'm broadcasting from today virtually. And we're gonna be talking with film critic Patrick Stoner in just a couple of minutes. I'll give you a few housekeeping things. Uh, you are at an adjacent table with us today and we want you to participate in the conversation. So your questions can go in that chat box over there on the right and I will make sure and get them to Patrick Stoner during this 50 minute conversation today. As I said before, Patrick Stoner, he is our guest today, and he is a film critic, and he is the host of, Pick, of Quick Picks and Flicks, which are uh, shows that deal with the culture and the creation of films and filmmakers and all kinds of things having to do with film, of course. And Flicks and Quick Picks can be seen on PBS and locally on WHYY, and Flicks is syndicated to many stations around the country. And I got to know Patrick about 30 years ago um, when we were fundraising. He is the consummate professional fundraiser. I have learned a ton from him. And why that is, I think, is because he really cares very passionately about public broadcasting and the work that he does, not only WHYY, but also the environment and politics. And one of my greatest joys is sharing green room time with him and the other fundraisers at HYY and hearing his stories uh, as he comes off the, um, the red eye from Los Angeles and from London and tells us some great stories. So I thought he would make a terrific guest for today to sit at the dinner table with us and talk about films and talk about stars and, and just really um, dig a little bit deeper into that. So I'll stop talking now and bring Patrick Stoner to the table and start this conversation. Patrick Stoner, welcome to Into the Absurd. Hello, Tina. I'm surprised you admit 30 years, huh? Hmm. I know. Well, One that does places <laughs> it places us a little bit in time, which hmm. actually leads me um, to a first question that I have for you. I want to. I definitely want to get into to flicks and quick picks because I had such a great. Um, I, I brushed up today on my flicks, and and I and I have so many questions for you, but. I know that you went to William and Mary, right? Mm -hmm. You were a, a theater major, and yeah. I believe I've heard you say that Glenn Close was either in the class. Oh, let me, I know I'm placing begin, you in time. Let's let's begin right there because there was <laughs> one. There was just one of the thousands of embarrassing moments in my life. Yeah, so Glenn Close was. Um, she was. She's actually was Glenn Wade. That was her real name. And she was married for four years and then divorced the man who was named Close, kept his name, though, and then came to William & Mary. So we're the same age, but as I was exiting as a senior, she was coming in as a freshman. And I went on up to New York, and there was this off-Broadway show called On Diet, Bank, Can't Live Forever. I produced it and kind of proud of it. So we sent back to the Alumni Gazette picture of the show that was in New York playing at the Improvisation, the only time the Improvisation ever had an off-Broadway play. And it was in the Alumni Gazette with that picture in one quarter of a great big page. The other three quarters of the page was the story of Glenn Close, who was an understudy on Broadway, and the star had to drop out because she got cancer. Glenn Close went on and had become the rage of Broadway, drowning out our tiny little thing down in the quarter of the page. So that is Glenn Close. I'm so happy you reminded me of it. I, I, I did remember the Glenn Close part about you guys being close to each other in school. I, I don't think I've ever heard that green room story before, the, the no, one I, about... I try not to tell it. <laughs> All right. Well, that's why you're here today, right? So, so yes. you're up in New York, right? Mm. After you get out of school, you go to New York. And was it your intention to be in the theater? Did you want to work oh, as I... an actor? Is that what you were... 
I thought I was, I, that, that's what I wanted to do. I went to HB Studios uh, and studied with uh, Catherine Sergava and uh, was, was, did little things like I was an off-Broadway Hamlet. I did Claudius the King off-Broadway. I did, I was briefly in a soap opera called Love of Life um, as a very small part, a detective called Gerhardt and what have you. I did those things. But then it was time we moved out of New York, went down to Richmond because of family opportunities. And it was then that I got a phone call from the CBS casting agent who said, listen, uh, Pat, um, you you taken the soap opera seminar over there at the studios and I uh, saw you. Uh, I'd like to offer you a part uh, in the doctors. Now it's not a big part, it's the minister, but you know what soap operas are like. The stars are going to be coming and asking the minister advice on a recurring role over and over again. So it's a pretty good deal. And I said, wow, uh, okay. Uh, they said, you said, can you get over here this afternoon? I was in Richmond. I said, uh, not this afternoon, but I can be there tomorrow. And there was this long pause. And he yeah. said, Pat, are you in the city? I said, no, but I can be there tomorrow. He said, Pat. I need somebody right away, but yeah. but look, when you're back in the city, you call me, I'll get you a role. I've never been back in the city as a yeah. professional actor. That's, that's, that's that story. And, story. and the minister is always, sad um, and that minister yeah. is always needed, you know? I mean, when I think of you, I do think of minister. I think of minister and minister. Well, I, that, that's what I studied to be. I was a pre-ministerial student at mm -hmm. William and Mary. Well, I see that. I, I mean, in our conversations in the green room, you know, your passion for the environment and for politics and whatnot, I, I, I see that. But I think, um, so Flix, let's, let's, I have so many questions for you about Flix and Quick Picks and, and sure. uh, to talk about forming, you know, the idea behind it, what it took to get mm -hmm. it started and, and just how that developed. Well, I, I had been doing originally theater reviews and then I switched over to film reviews and that was kind of interesting. And then the people at the time who were in charge, this was around 1983, I suppose, they wanted to offer something to the syndication service, which at that time was called the Interregional Program Service, it's now called American Public Television. And they had a little program called Spotlight that featured things around the area, little filler programs. And they wanted to throw in another program just to add to it. And so I suggested, Flicks. It was a, then a four-minute program, interviews with film stars, and I happened to have an interview with a film star that I'd gotten while I was visiting California, Chubby Chase, so we used that as the sample. And at the end of the day, when it was offered to the stations around the country, uh, Flicks, you needed to have 40 stations agree to syndicate. Flicks got 44 stations agreeing to syndicate. Spotlight got four. Irritating the heck out of my bosses, as you could imagine, since I was supposed to be the stalking horse for their show. But that was the beginning of syndication. And uh, if you saw the Tom Hanks interview, he mentions that I first interviewed him for Splash in 1984. 80, I think that that was one thing that stood out for me in watching the, I put it sort of on continuous play today, and I went back and watched some of the ones from 2019 as well. And one thing that comes through and... Uh, so it's a question about about you as an interviewer, but what I noticed, and it came up again and again and again with Tom Hanks, with Ian McKellen and Helen Mirren, with Spike Lee, just how relaxed and how much they seem to really admire you. And I'm what the thought that occurred to me was because you come from performing and you are an actor and you know about filmmaking. It's very clear in those interviews to me that that knowledge is a story that winds through your, you know, your work. Tell, tell me, do you feel like that you're different in that regard? Well, there are two things. One is I'm old and I've been interviewing some of these people for literally decades and you have a shared history and anybody that you know that you have a shared history with, even if it's only like periodically, you only see them every three or four months or something, over a period of years, you have a shared history and you feel like you know each other. The other thing is, I, at least I was trained as an actor. I understand what actors go through, what directors have to do. What, I understand all that, so I know the language. And they're not used to that. They're used to celebrity interviews, tabloid interviews, 
something that is hot, something that will drive the ratings up for that night when it's on the news, something like that. So if you sit down and my mandate that I created for myself is to talk about film craft, mm -hmm. they love it. It's like a vacation for them, not because of me, but because of what we're talking about. And yeah. over time, they know when I come back to interview them before, it's like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. all right, let's, let's talk film. Well, you can certainly, you saw that like Spike Lee was like leaning into the camera. Tom <laughs> Hanks was just like, he, you could see them wanting to, to share that more. So it, that clearly, clearly makes sense. And I loved the segment with Tom Hanks in A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood where he was talking about the part where he had to learn because Mr. Rogers looked directly into the camera and that was not something that he's used to doing. And uh, that story was really fun. That was the, I was proud of that moment. That's the kind of thing I'm looking for because that is about film craft. And it's not something that I think maybe if you didn't, if you, if you don't come from an acting background, but you're just sort of a, a TV person who's doing interviews, celebrity interviewing, you may or may not know. But film actors are trained not to look into the camera. Meryl Streep told me once when I closed out an interview and I looked into the camera and said, with Meryl Streep in Los Angeles, I'm Patrick Stoner. End of interview. She says, you know, I can't do that. I said, what do you mean you can't do? She said, I can't look into a camera and talk to it. I said, you can't. No. She said, I'm trained not to. I'm trained. That camera is not there. Pay no attention to the camera. To look into the camera directly, would, I, I, I'm not sure I could do it. Now, Meryl Streep could do anything. And she undoubtedly has it many times. Looked into a camera and done it. But she's making a point there. It goes against all of their training. And Tom's point was, is that he's trained that way too. But there was a moment in the restaurant where he's talking and he has to just look directly into the camera and hold it for almost a minute. And he said it was the longest minute mm -hmm. of his life because it went against his entire lifetime of acting training. And that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. That was kind of cool. That was a great part of that interview where he talked about how, like, yeah, the terrifying that longest moment of his career was in doing something that, you know, that that you as a television person are trained to do. It was, I, I, I he's such a wonderful, you did such a wonderful interview with him. I thought that was. Um, well, it's not exactly like he's a hard interview. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, but you could also just, I think so much of that is that he really wanted to be there. And I would well, yeah, imagine he, that he, he approved me. He uh, actually had to ask them to include me. He, did only, he doesn't do TV interviews anymore. He stopped doing that a few years ago because he said all the, t I like, he said his actual quote was, I love the TV people. They're all really nice, but all they want to do is talk to me about what a nice person I am. And isn't it great what a wonderful marriage that I have? And he said, I don't want to talk about any of that. I want to talk about something that I poured my heart into my work, but mm -hmm. they won't. So I'm stopping doing TV interviews, except ones I have to do just to get people to, you know, go see it. And so he now just does a few national interviews, but he promised me once, uh, well, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story. Uh, I belong to the Critics' Choice Association. We have an annual awards banquet, banquet where we, it's an award show, uh, and uh, it's on television. You, you, you can look it up, um, Critics' Choice Awards. and um, it's a, you know, at the tables and all, just like all other award shows. So I was outside of that. Um, I think the person I went out with wanted to smoke a cigarette. I don't smoke, but, you know, I went out. It's kind of dark outside. And suddenly out of the shadows comes Tom Hanks with his usual, Patrick Stoner, if it isn't Patrick Stoner, how are you doing, fella? And, oh, Tom, hi. So we chatted for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then at the end of it, I said, you know, look, Tom, I know you don't do TV anymore. I understand why. But if we could ever just find a place and just sit down and talk about films, just that, I'd love it. He said, I'll tell you what, you talk to, and he mentioned his publicist, and you talk to him. And if you can get a crew anywhere I am, on set, at my home, anywhere, if you can get a crew there, we'll do it. Well, Tina, you know what the likelihood of WHOY sending me with a crew to Los Angeles or wherever he is in the world on a set, as in zilch. Still, when it came time for the, that interview for the Mr. Rogers uh, film, 
uh, I decided, what the heck, I'll test out his promise. So I, I contacted this publicist and said, listen, I know you're going to think I'm blowing smoke, but Tom said he'd do an interview any place, any time. Would you mind asking him if I could do an interview while he's in New York doing his national interviews? Fifteen minutes later, Tom said, make it happen. And he did. Well, I think it, you can see that in the, in well, the, the way that, that it, story is not something about me. Tom Hanks is a man of his word. He's known to be incredibly nice, but he's also a man of integrity. Well, he doesn't need me. He didn't need yeah, my interview. But I mean, that wasn't it at all. But I think, too, you know, if you've got a lot, like, I, I try to imagine how many of these junket, when you go on a junket, how many are they, like, how long do you have, actually, with each person? They've got to be doing, what, 50 a day or mm, a lot? Not quite. 25? It's, very, it's, 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 I've been doing this a long, long time. Um, it used to be far more. Um, it would be maybe, um, and remember, the, all these, these people are from all over the country plus Canada. Uh, and so it might be about it might be about 25 to 30 in a day. That's a, but, but that's a lot of, well, a lot of times. Yes, but it is incredibly efficient. If you bought airtime uh, mm -hmm. on all, in all of those uh, stations all over the country and in Canada, you'd be spending, I don't know, at least hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions, I suppose. And if you instead bring everybody together in one day and you all get your time, you all get, your one-on-one -on -one interview, mm -hmm. um, you have, it's a very, very cost-efficient way of doing things. Right. And but I mean, if, if thinking about it's them. Gone, now you understand we're remote and everybody's right. remote. Nobody's doing in-person interviews anymore. So the last time I interviewed Tom, was it last week? Mm -hmm. uh, we were doing it like this. So getting back to your point about the camera and how actors are really not trained or if they're working on film, it's really the camera is not there. Have they... So they, I assume they're speaking into, they're speaking into the camera when they're talking to you in these remote interviews. Has that? No, no, no. No, no they're not? Oh, I see what you're see saying. See what I'm saying on these remote interviews? Well, Has that look, really? Look at, look at what I'm doing now. That's a, that's a, just set yeah. aside anybody else that's watching this and just treat you and me. Uh, I guess my camera is there, right? Yeah, that's it. It's off on the side. Mm -hmm. So as I'm talking to you, I don't want to be looking there. I'm talking to you like this. I'm really looking off camera as I'm talking to you mm -hmm. because it feels more natural to be looking right, right into the middle of my screen. And so that's, that, that, that would be true of Tom too. He would be talking slightly off camera. So it didn't have the same thing as if you are ordered and there's one camera and it's up close to you like this and it's capturing every tiny little hair mm -hmm. in your eyebrow and your expression. Yes. Um, it's, it's different. I, I do think, though, I'm, not, I'm like a dog on a bone in this one. I, I do think going back to the number of interviews they have to do in any given day, though, I do think that to have someone come in the room that is really seeing them in a very different and unique light, I think that changes the, well, the, the, the fundamental. So I, I think well, you're yeah, selling yourself short. You no, never do no, that. I, but <laughs> you're, you're, describe, you're describing exactly what I said in just slightly different way. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I'm there to talk about film prep. Yes, it's a breath of fresh so air. So I think that's your credit. I mean, I think that's what makes you, you know, sort of different. Do you, well, do I'll you take prepare? credit for the idea. Yeah. I, I no, don't take and, and your history. Me. Your, your, your personal history with the people is separate from that. Mm -hmm. You either develop that over a period of time or you don't. There are people that I've interviewed for years and years and years that I have no personal history with. In fact, I don't very much like, like, say, Tommy Lee Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't develop the person. What people like Morgan Freeman and Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks and Winona Ryder and Johnny Depp, many of these people have gone out of their way to make sure Johnny Depp, until he ran into all of his problems, um, he told me once, you're going to be doing, every time I do an interview, you will be there. And I said, well, <laughs> that's not up to me, you know, and I don't know about that. And he said, you will be there. I promise you. And he kept his word, too. Um, so I may have a different feeling about Johnny Depp than the general public does right now. <laughs> you were asking something else. Well, no, I was just going to say, I, I want to get to the actual content of Flicks in a second, because I have a question about how each one is, is, is very different. It's like its own little film, and I have a question about that. But 
I know we've talked about this before because in You're fundraising, ask if I prepare, aren't ex you? well, I, I was going to, and I know the answer to it because we always talk about this, and you and you do, and I totally agree with you about this that that the mistakes are sometimes the greatest moments that happen in a live situation. Is that what I was going to say? No, no, but I'm saying <laughs> when you and I have been on stage, uh, when we've been fundraising before and a mistake comes up or something, you know, whatever we would classify as a mistake, you just always remind me, which is the great- that, Yes, but the, you're, you're in an entirely but different I'm at, area Yeah, now. right, For I fundraising, am, fundraising, but... a mistake is helpful because when a mistake happens, the very next thing that the, the audience sees, they're not paying attention to. So mistakes can be helpful for fundraising. Mistakes in an interview don't, doesn't apply. But I thought you were going to ask me, if you'll forgive me, I, I shouldn't be answering a question I didn't actually get asked, but I was sure you were going to ask me, uh, do you prepare questions? Because that's, I get well, that's that question tied to the mis lot. Yeah, well, that, it's tied to it's that not thought. It's not about mistakes. Well, that no, 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 it's not about mistakes. mistakes. It's not about mistakes. The, the thought was, I had was, as we've talked about before, that sometimes just entering the room with who you are and your knowledge is the way to go into it. And don't think too much about the questions. Don't think too much about what you want to ask. So it has can nothing I to do with mistakes. A, uh, but can I tell a, a risque story? Is that allowed? Are we on in an area where uh, we will not be? Um, I'm okay with it. I, I, th I mean, we'll hear about yeah. it in the chat box if, and people are dining at home. So. Well, this is Jane Fonda. And she, it, it, it's down the edge. It's, it's not explicit, but it's down the edge. You'd have to be pretty slow not to get it. But if you're comfortable with that, this will explain why what? I do not prepare questions. All right, shoot away. Okay. okay. The film was Old Gringo many years ago. Gregory Peck, Jane Fonda in it and directed it. Also a newcomer by the name of Jimmy Smits. You know who Jimmy Smits is? Yes, he's famous now. He wasn't then, this was his first thing. And this was 19... I don't remember. I, okay. Look it up guys, okay. it's old. I'll, I'll look it up. 1990, couple, three, four, I don't know. Anyhow, so I'm doing an interview and Jane and I are getting along really well because I talked to her about her father, Henry Fonda, and how much she wanted his approval. And for some reason she was really into talking about that. And we're having a good time. And my time's coming up to an end and I'm realizing, uh, oh, okay, where am I gonna go from here? So I, I go for the obvious, I say, uh, boy, uh, Jimmy Smith, that dude guy, he's, he's really something, isn't he? And Jane says, oh, yeah. When women see Jimmy in this film, they're gonna slide right off their seats. And I don't get it. I miss it entirely. I'm now back in an edging room. I'm sitting there and I'm listening to her. You side didn't hear her or you didn't get it? I didn't get it. Oh, come on. I didn't really? get it. All right. So I, I'm in the right, editing fine. room and she, <laughs> her, it's, I'm seeing her side up on camera. I can't. And I see her say, when they see Jimmy, they're going to slide right off their seats. And I, what did she say? <laughs> what did I say? And I look at my camera. And this is what I said. Well, Jane, you're not exactly chopped liver. I saw a lot of men sliding off their seats last night at the screening. So you fixed oh, it. I, I look back to see what her reaction was, and it was this. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. It was so clearly, I thought I was talking to somebody intelligent, but no. Uh, well, do, what do you think that was? Were you just like, literally, you just, I mean, you heard it, but you just didn't, it just That's didn't land. That's why I land. told the story. Because yeah. when I started interviewing, I had the plexiglass clipboard, the questions all on it. And as they were answering one question, I'd glance down to see what my next question was. Well, mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Now I'm thinking about that next question. I should really be listening. So no more clipboard. Now I've got three by five cards. They're not as obvious. It doesn't look as pretentious. A lot of people take in three by five cards on these uh, interviews. But as they were answering a question, I would be thinking about the next question, looking down at it. No good. I put the three by five cards in my pocket so I couldn't see them. 
But as they were answering the question, I'd be thinking, what's the next question that's in my three by five card right here? After the Jane Fonda inc incident, I said to myself, no more questions anywhere. That way, if I'm not listening to the answer, I got nothing. And the adrenaline from the danger of mm -hmm. that will make sure that I keep the interview going and make it worth watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the listening part of it, right, is everything. I mean, Listen. you're telling, you're telling yeah. this story right now, and I'm look, I, had to, you know, I wanted to check the chat box because there's a lot of questions coming in. And the mental acuity that it takes to do that and then realizing, and by the way, Old Gringo is 1989. 89. Um, okay. 89. Yeah. So based on the novel by Carlos Fuentes, who taught at the University of Pennsylvania. So we have that well, as a, that's, okay. Uh, really but I, but I mean, it's, it's so true that the mind <clears throat> really has to open up and the ears and et cetera. Uh, that's, well, you'd be amazed what fear can, can do as a benefit to you. Yes. I listen very, very, very carefully. I, I go in with a hook. I know there's some aspect of this film I'm going to feature. Like, for example, with Tom Hanks, my hook was, his, his things he was doing to the camera, like Mr. Rogers did. I was gonna explore that. That's how that got me to the point where he said, oh, you know that one moment when I was looking directly into the camera, that's an entirely different thing. I was terrified. That's how I got there. So I have yeah. a hook and then I listen to the answer and follow where that takes me, which is for me, the most comfortable way to do it. Let's um, jump over. I have a couple of questions about, um, so watching again Tom Hanks in the the Greyhound um, that that brand flicks um, the brand new and so many so many fabulous things that he talked about, uh, in, including in that interview with with you about how it was presented from his thoughts, sort of the inside of his mind. Like so, really, my question is: in each of the flicks, I'll just take three of, for instance, the Spike Lee the Greyhound, and then say uh, the interview that you did with um, uh, Ian McKellen and uh, Helen Mirren, where in some of them, it focuses, you know, you see a lot more of the film. So it, that was the case of the uh, Greyhound, right? You see a lot of, you hear Tom talking about it, Tom voicing underneath of it, that w it was important for him to have people understand that it was the inside, what was going on in the inside of his mind. So it was not, it was not, th it was not through the words that we'd find out what was going on. It would be visual. That was the hook that I went in with. Right. And so did you do, does Joe, do you do the decide, okay, this is what this little, this three to four minute film is going to look like. It's going to feature mostly clips and voiceover. Who does, who makes those decisions? Well, ultimately, it's my responsibility, but uh, my editor, whom you know, uh, Joanne Palameco, has been my editor for now for many years, so she knows every little thing that I care about and the things to look for. Now, in this case, um, she's good, and when you, if you started out by saying, because Tom was also the screenwriter for Greyhound, remember, that's unusual now. He didn't mm -hmm. direct it, but he was the star, and he was the screenwriter, so he's playing the part he wrote for himself. And there are almost no words in it that reveal what's going on inside of Tom's head. So I wanted to start by saying, Tom, what I noticed was, is that you've written this role so that there are no words to give any feeling for what he's going through at all. It all has to be shown visually without making it too obvious that you're showing it. That's an interesting challenge. That's the direction I went in. So mm -hmm. of course, as he starts talking about that, and then he says, we added in things like long shots to show what the old convoy and everything was looking like over and all. And naturally, a good editor hearing that knows this is the time to roll in clips to get a feel for that. So you'd understand what it is he's talking about. She's just simply good. Yeah, you, I mean, you really got it. I didn't have to ask her because it was so obvious that a good editor like that would simply know what to do. And she did. Well, yeah, and you just, I came away with, like, I, I come away with something different in these little snippets that I was watching all afternoon. I came away with a different feeling and a different experience in each one. And it felt like a little film to me. I mean, I've certainly watched flicks before, but I'm going to say I caught up on a bunch this afternoon. Like then going over to um, to Five Bloods, the Spike Lee, uh, the it Bloods, was yeah. mostly f focused in on him. And he's so such a wonderful speaker and and I felt like your conversation was really centered in on your history with him and and sort of how his films have changed 
you know, that was your specific conversation, as I remember in that one, well, where, you know. I if, first interviewed Spike when he came to the station, oh my gosh, 30 years ago. Uh, he wasn't, he wasn't as big as he was going to become. And I did an interview with him for like half an hour or more sitting in the old wonderful place that we used to have. So that's how long I've been interviewing. Now, over the years, uh, I've interviewed him and he was, he's, he used to be known as a very difficult interview and he still can be if he's not in the mood to do it, I'm told, um, by some people who, because he can just kind of sit there, likes to plunge in the chair, and he's not in the mood, you're not going to get much out of him. But I discovered by accident early on that he liked to be teased, that that was the way through to him. So I remember from Malcolm X, for example, a film that I deeply admired, and I, I believe uh, Denzel uh, deserved the Oscar for him. Um, I was talking to him about Malcolm X and the, the things that he had to do to show Malcolm X in his home life. And I said, look, Spike, I, I don't like to be negative in one of these interviews, but frankly, I, I need to know something. I want to know if you made this up, trying to fake us out because you thought saying, oh, I know this about them, his home life, or if it was really true. Did Malcolm X actually have plastic on his furniture? <laughs> and he lost it. <laughs> and then he teases back. So as you saw by this time, whether I'm interviewing him for whatever, Harriet, uh, you, you name it, uh, any of the any of his Spike Lee films, his documentaries, whatever, um, it's usually a lot of laughter back and forth, which helps him open up. Mm -hmm. That was the that was the ticket into Spike. So because you because that happened, I mean, you really. Uh, just in that in that three minutes and four seconds, saw a, a just a really uh, beautiful uh, e example of the interior of him. You know. Uh, well, there's one other thing. He knows that uh, he knows where I'm coming from. Let's see now. Th this is me personally. I'm not making a statement about uh, WHYY or PBS or anything else. This is just me personally. He knows where I'm coming from in some social areas that he cares very much about. He knows that I, I care that Black Lives Matter. So he knows that. He doesn't need me to demonstrate it over the years, but too many things we've talked about. So he's very comfortable uh, in that area. And I, I don't want to, saying that out loud, it, it sounds too pompous so I'm, I'm gonna let that go let's go to another one that i uh artemis fowl um which <laughs> Boy, was a, there is there's a leap churn, right they would say in tv world but i i'm using it as an example because it was also another example of where much more of the clip of the which i th was really helpful to me it got me really interested in the story and the story of the boy looking for his father. It made me want to go out and want to see the film. Maybe not go out and see the film, but see the film, you know. Well, it's a good um, director, Kenneth Branagh, mm -hmm. mostly known for his Shakespeare films. Uh, well, okay, that was a good example. Now, I mean, th I'm talking to the author, that's what that interview is with, um, Owen uh, Colfer, Owen Col who authored the books. So I'm not talking to a star, I'm not talking to a director, I'm not even talking, well, he did help with the screenplay. Uh, he and Kenneth worked closely together. But because he's the author, I can't show him up there playing a part, or he's a famous director like Spike, so you know who he is anyhow. Then we had to, of course, put a lot of clips in there so that you'd see what the heck he was talking about. And if you notice, the hook that I went in on that is the Irishness of it all. Because he's Irish, very Irish, mm -hmm. and it matters to him. And mm -hmm. Kenneth Branagh, who people tend to think of as English because of Shakespeare, is Irish. And they went together to make this a very Irish film that was from his books. Well, I felt like I got to understand the whole, I don't often hear interviews with, with people that have written screenplays, and it really gave a sense of, of how he got to the meat of the story, which is this little boy's search for his, his father, which then, mm -hmm. you know, it really does such a great job of, of making me want to, to to check out the film, to find out more about the author, to find out more about the filmmaker, which is, I think, one of the 
great parts about the series, really successful in that regard because it just gets you intrigued. Well, you know, we're, that's a point I guess we haven't made. During this period of time, when we're doing remote interviews, it's different from before. Um, before, when I was doing interviews, it was films and theaters, obviously. And there aren't films and theaters, not to speak of, here and there, not, nothing really. So the whole point to what we're doing now is, I don't care where you can see it. In the case of Artemis Fowl, you can see it on Disney+, Plus, for example. In the case of Defy Bloods or Greyhound or what have you, I think uh, you, you can see it Amazon Prime or other places like that. I don't care where, because during this period of time, we're trying to help people find something to take them out of themselves, to see what might rise to the level of art, if it does, and if not, at least something that gets you through this period of time when you're streaming everything. That's something that if we were going to be talking about the profession, it's the streaming revolution that is so gigantic. But, um, but I think the beauty of, of what you're doing surrounding it makes me want to, and because we all have more time, it makes me want to go investigate this author, this, um, you know, read more about all these things. And so it, it, it really... He's a fun he's, guy. I'm a friend of mine who also interviewed him, a Canadian. She said, wouldn't he be fun just to go to lunch with him? I said, yes, yes. He said, let's all three, let's go to lunch with this in, guy. In that short time, he had so many great, thoughtful, uh, mm -hmm. what makes a good script, what makes a good, you know, what, what makes it all, it's stuff you know, but like to hear him say it, I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's great. So there's so many questions well, it's here. the gift of the gab. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, you got, I mean, you got him to, to get to that heart of it, which is, um, there's a bunch of questions here, but I'm going to go to one about, uh, has anything changed? In your in your from your lucite clipboard days, I mean, you say you know you got rid oh. of that, and you but is that, what what has fundamentally changed for you? Is it just listening? Is it well? I'm assuming that you're you're not asking about the most obvious because obviously during the uh, virus situation, being remote and everything, and this and having to recommend things and go to streaming. But even before the whole virus thing happened, as early as this time last year maybe, and before that, there was a revolution going on in the business. And therefore, because this was going on in the business, it was going on for me too. And that was the rise of Netflix, the rise of Amazon, Hulu, you name it. But the big one, the gigantic bear roaming the city, grizzly size, Netflix. And the studios did not know what to do because they could see this coming to mix my metaphors as if the tsunami was roaring this way and then you weren't sure whether to get the high ground or get a boat. You, 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 you clearly, things have changed gigantically and they'll never be the same. The streaming services are not going to go away. And now because of the virus, people have developed habits that they didn't have before. You might've said in say uh, January, well, I know there's this Netflix thing out there, and every once in a while I want to see a movie, but you know, I, it's a family, and we, we go to the theater every week, you know, it's just a matter of that. That's all changed. Now, they're exploring avenues in the internet and streaming services that they never even dreamed existed before. And that, of course, changes everything that I'm doing as well. It'll never go back to quite the same thing. Is, and, and so for, with Flix, we are really, you are, focusing on the craft and all of that and that's what you're bringing to the table so it could be writers it could be directors it could be not Whereas usually quick, oh not usually. It's, it's usually it's almost, it's, when i wrote the thing it was uh, it would be i would say it would be household names so it would be stars that you've heard of and and all this would be a much smaller group directors that you've heard of um authors it would have to be somebody like stephen king you know a household name Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Owen Culver, Artemis Fowl is gigantic. It's, it's, it's close to, you know, Harry Potter level in terms of its popularity. So that seemed appropriate. Let me take another question. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, wait, let me go to that other one. It's up there at the top. Uh, do you ever feel invested on a personal level with a subject's careers? Like, so you go, I, I'm assuming this is what the question I'm going to interpret it, but where you go in and you're like, 
and and you've either viewed the film and thought, well, this might not have been his best work. And maybe when you get in the room, they know it's not their best work. And sort of how does that dance go? Well, let's see. I could do a number of examples. I guess my favorite would be Sandra Bullock, but she's everybody's favorite anyhow, isn't she? Um, Speed 2. Now, Speed, of course, was one of the most successful films ever made, action film. Remember, it was a Sandra Bullock on a bus that a terrorist is with a bomb. You slow below 50 miles an hour, it's going to break it below everybody up. A very, very good action film. So, of course, they wanted to make a sequel. And they made a sequel called Speed 2. Terrible, terrible film. And Sandra was also starring in that. I don't remember where we were, somewhere in the Los Angeles area, and we were doing the interview on a patio somewhere. And I sit down, and I'd interviewed Sandra before, and we'd had a lot of fun together. I remember once she, she kind of lost it and was laughing so much, she began, people that I showed the clip to, they thought she was kind of faking it and overdoing it, just, you know, oh, oh she's trying to show off that she likes you, it's all fake, she's an actress, and then she started snorting in electric, she couldn't control it. <laughs> They said, no, no, no <laughs> woman would be doing that intentionally. <laughs> this is not attractive. And uh, so we, my point is we've kind of gotten along course. So I'm there and I sit down for speed too. And I said, well, and I got about that far. And she said, Pat, I can't do this. I can't do this. And so she said, here, here's how we're going to do this. And she came over and she jumped on my lap. She said, we're doing this interview on my lap, on your lap. So I'm there, and we were there, and she's Mike, I'm Mike. And so we did Speed 2 interview with Sandra on my lap, laughing and joking and turning it into a very fun, silly thing because she knew, she said, it was a terrible, terrible film. And she didn't want to talk about it. Wow. So is that that's sort of like a public, re, a great public relations ploy? And that is, we're gonna we're gonna create some fun here. We're gonna get the name of the film out, but we're just gonna shy away from. What, what, let me ask you, what made it? Do you remember? I didn't see the I didn't see the second. What made it not good? Do you remember? Well, to begin with, the first one was an original idea. At that time, nobody had thought about. It. Gee, isn't that clever? Gosh. You're on a bus. And it's rigged so that if it doesn't, if it goes below 50 miles an hour, it will explode. So you have to keep it up to speed, no matter what is in front of you. And if it's a barrier, you somehow got to keep going or you're all dead. And then Keanu Reeves, who was, you know, trying to save him, had to get onto the speeding bus somehow to disarm the bomb. It was an original, interesting idea, very well timed. So they wanted to do the same thing. And I forget what Speed 2's basic cook was, but I remember it was on the water. I guess that's why we were on the patio with the water behind us uh, doing the interviews. They were trying to recreate the, that kind of a feeling and speed boats and what have you. But it, 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 it was so clearly just a, a secondary ripoff of the same idea, but without the tension and without Keanu Reeves, who was kind of good in it. And I, I didn't think I'd ever be saying that too much about him. I first time I interviewed Keanu Reeves, you know, uh, Bill and Ted's uh, adventure. Keanu at that time was on a lot of stuff. Okay, so it was the two of them sitting on a couch, me interviewing. Keanu's on his side, lying on his side. His partner is sitting up, doing interviews. So. They say in go. In the shot? Yeah, in the shot. On his He's side? On his side. So they say go. And I'm looking across. I'm supposed to do an interview with one guy sitting up normally and the guy sitting next to him lying on his side. So I laid on my side. And I did the interview with me on my side, interviewing them with Keanu on his side. Now, is, I is don't this... claim that this was the most intellectual thing I've ever come up with, but you tell me what you would do if you had your interview lying on his side there. Well, you know, it, it sort of reminded me, I was watching this Dick, ha this Dick Cavett episode the other day with Salvador Dali, where he comes on with an anteater. And it's just like, you know, you really, he really just had to really get out of the way and just follow, follow the dance, the, you know, the whole the, Salvador Dali was just like, you know, taking the anteater all over the stage. So it sounds like, I'm going to look, is that one up? Can I find it? What are you talking about? That interview? 
Oh, it's one where you're laying on your side. It's 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 not. Are you, oh, you're talking too what? long. No, it's thirty yeah. thirty-five years. No, it's. I don't know. I thought there was like disappeared into the mist. No, so things didn't go into the cloud in those days. So 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 one of our um, one of the folks who's helping us actually on the show today says Sandra's uh, our neighbor here in Austin. Ask her about it. <laughs> Ask her. When they when that, they're not going out of the house. So you did an interview for Speed too on that PBS guy's <laughs> lap. Astrobot. It's Greg Day chiming in over there. Um, I want to talk just real quickly. We're, there's not too much time left here, but I, I love the the whole interview with Ian McKellen and Her Helen Mirren where, again, this issue of like comfort and ease came up. And they talked a lot about the London, the London theater and how everyone knows each other, you know, there. Yeah. Can, you, can you speak a little to that? About yeah, England's... England's uh... The England theatrical world, film world, and TV world, is it's intertwined to an extent that we only come close to in America. I mean, after all, in the old days, no film star would ever allow himself to be seen on TV. It meant your career was over, and you were desperately going to do the Big Valley Barbara Stanwyck or something like that. Um, but in Britain, in England, a small number, maybe, maybe about 30, they named Judy Dench and you know, you know the, the people, all the ones, Helen Mirren and all those people, Ian McKellen and blah, blah, blah. Uh, they all work together constantly. They work together on stage. They work together in TV. They work together in films. They're working all the time in a million different roles. And it is a tight knit group. Like um, uh, if, you, uh, if you check this sometimes out when they're, they're actually doing a film together, I mean, they have a shorthand of working together so that their film craft is so easy because they know all the different levels and strings that the other person can pull. And so they can just play with each other and hand them those things to, to create the feeling of the hand. It's really, it's really quite wonderful. I, I just love going over there or if they come here and talking to them, but I particularly love going over there and talking to them about it. You could really see that at play and you alluded to that in the interview in The Good Thief that the, the, yeah. the, 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 they're working together on the screen is just really sublime, like that, that just intricate, just what you just talked about. Like they know each other so well that it just is like such a beautiful dance. Um, I'm amazed that in this interview, which I'm looking over here, I guess it's got about 10 minutes, maybe left. You haven't even mentioned once Dot Mebby. Well, I was speaking. I was just looking at the clock over and I'm like, oh Lord, we didn't get to Downton yet. Well, one thing I want to do before we get to Downton too yeah. is just talk to you because you were really the one that rallied me to be a uh, a Britcom, uh, a, a, Br a British mystery and the Brit box and all, and all of that and to really, you know, kind of dig into that. So I love what you were talking about before. If you're tuning into any one of those, Father Brown or any of those. Midsummer and Nervous Doctor. Midsummer, uh, and they're all popping Billy. up. Father all these Brandon. huge stars are popping up and I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's, you know, Fiona Shaw. Guest like, stars, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's so, uh, that's part of the fun of it, right? Midsummer Murders particularly, just seeing oh, yeah. who's going to pop up behind the bush, Every you know? Every British actor you've ever known has been on Midsummer Murders at least. That Midsummer Murders is interesting because it had a contract that I've never heard anywhere else before. Midsummer Murders is the longest running uh, mystery. Uh, maybe, maybe any other kind of British program, I don't know. That's, I better not say that. Certainly the longest running mystery in British history. It's been going for decades and decades. It's just gotten a new star. But the previous star who did it for I think, 24 years or something like that, he had a contract that when it was so big early on, after about five or six years, and was obviously going to be renewed, they gave him a contract that said he, unless illness or something else forced him not to be in it, he got to choose when he left the series. Otherwise, his contract was automatically renewed for a new season. And I've never heard of such a contract anywhere for anybody other than that. But he was that He's, good, and yeah. the program is that good. By the way, uh, our good friend who wrote the Downton Abbey um, was uh, often – had written a number of the mysteries because he wrote many mysteries for many different shows for the years. I do. Have you watched Vera? Are you a Vera? Yes, fan? I love Brenda. Vera. Yes. Oh my! I was just Brenda watching Blethers. that again. Oh, oh that so show good. is a is a is a trip through an art museum. It's a trip. It's a travelogue. It's a beautifully written, and she's just 
amazing. And I, I'm all, I, I, am, I am interested, as you talked about, like the, the, the assistants, when the, you get a new lead detective and then they have a new assistant that comes assistant, in, that yeah, sort always. of yeah. relationship that develops is, is always so great. But I'm going to look you, over the- Then you have the Morse thing. Remember, there was first Morse from the, from the series of books. And then his assistant, after the actor died and Morse discontinued, he became the star of the show. And then we get Endeavor, which is- mm -hmm the new generation the mm -hmm. earlier morse it, it's i love i simply love the british mysteries the whole world of it well um let's yeah let's devote the last couple of minutes we're, we're a little bit over here but if you can stay for dessert then we'll a couple more minutes here we'll we wouldn't be right if we didn't jump into um a show that you have a lot of love for and that a lot of people around the world had, had a lot of love for and just that you were able to follow all of those seasons and that's Downton and I'll just I have no specific mm. question for you other than um, okay what do you think's I can, coming I mean do you think what do you what do you think I mean that's not a great question let's just x that question off and let and you go ahead <laughs> I'm going to ask myself the question, when did you know that Downton, the Downton was a thing? Was That's a great question, Pat. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Pat. Well, Pat, thanks for asking. That's a good question. I actually, I, I watched Downton, and I thought, I love the costume drama, so I'm going to see this costume drama. I get the general idea. It's sort of like an upstairs, downstairs thing. There's going to be the upstairs hoi polloi and the downstairs people. Okay, good, good, good. So I watched an episode and they set it all up, introduced us to the characters. Okay, I got the idea. Then I saw the second episode and we began to see that the, that the characters are kind of interesting, really. And then and by the third episode, I remember saying to myself, this is different. This is written really, really well. This is gonna be huge. So I went to WHYY. They had not asked me to fundraise around it. They asked Ed and Willow, because Ed and Willow have this, you know, demeanor that just seems so right, like sitting in a in a comforting chair. And maybe I can picture Ed with a pipe in his mouth and Willow and her, you know, lovely lady talking about Downton Abbey. Well, Ed had never even seen Downton Abbey. It took him an entire year to see the first episode. And I went to them, I said, This, I want part of this. I want part of the show. It's not like anything else they've ever done. It's going to be huge. And they let me do that. So from then on in, mm -hmm. I not only did that, but I also live tweeted during it at one point. And then when they made the film, I was the only American, the only American invited over to interview them there when they opened it one week early in London. I'm proud of that. Well, you should be. I mean, you, uh, you certainly got all of us over the course of time, all of oh, us yeah, the meeting Downton the first- Digest that we wrote too. Yeah. Oh, they, I'm sorry, the people at WHY wrote, they, I just had my sort of face on it and wrote a little introduction, but I got all the credit for it because my name and face was all over it. But I think four or 5,000 people uh, signed up for that, yeah. Do you think that it was, I mean, we, we, it, we talk about the richness of the show, the storyline, the characters, the costumes. I mean, it, it almost seems like when I watch past episodes of it i will find something new every time and i guess that just speaks to the layers and layers i mean that's the brilliance of the filmmaking of it and just the the layering of all of those of all of those elements that you can find something new in it each time you watch is there before we uh before we sign off here is there an is there a downstairs story is there an inside story is there a fun story that you want to share about downton that um is not you remember in a way that you do not expect me to do, in a way this, I'm holding in my hand my cell phone. I'm holding up my cell phone and hoping that you can see it. You can, you can catch it if you're in front it's of It's a picture of me in front of Downton Abbey holding a cell phone that has a picture of me in front of Downton Abbey. You had mentioned the costumes. The Winter Tour Museum in Delaware had the costumes of Downton Abbey on display for several months. My youngest daughter was getting married. She had, she got married and had her reception at the Winter Tour Museum. So while they had the costume displays there, they had a full wall picture of Downton Abbey. 
So I went in there with my cell phone and I took a picture of that, me holding it up as if I was standing in front of Downton Abbey, used it for my cell phone. WHYY saw that and they took that picture and for all of the Downton Abbey events, there would be me in that picture because I'm doing this, which was originally to say, come to my daughter's reception. Mm -hmm. That was the, the original point to that. But that became, come to the WHYY event for Downton Abbey. Patrick Stoner, I could talk to you all night. These stories are just are just wonderful. And just thank you so much for all your work on WHYY and Flicks and Quick Picks and for sharing your time with us today. I know you, um, this is not your favorite thing to do, but you certainly are a great storyteller and you have Well, kept it's not us. your favorite thing to do to be nice to me all this time too. <laughs> This is the I, longest period of time since we've known each other for 30 years that you've uh, been this nice to me. I, I hate to see you go now. I have great <laughs> admiration for you, and I've, oh, I've learned please. so much from you, Patrick, over these. I do. I very oh, much heavens. do. And I'm really glad that I tuned into Flicks because, like, while I've watched them before, I didn't see the recent ones. So that's... Um, that is a huge gift to the community. And, uh, and I know a lot of you and most of you must be uh, supporters of WHRY, but if you're not, do it. We'll make that quick um, pitch right now too. And for everyone watching, thanks for coming in today. And we'll be back here next Saturday at 5 p.m. With a, with a new guest and just look out for your email or check our Facebook page and I will reveal who that person is um, midweek. And we just appreciate uh, you being here and sharing it with friends. So everybody, thank you, Patrick, so much. Thank and you. have a great dinner and a great week, everyone. Bye-bye.